And it's a large group, international membership, and we raise a lot of money and use that for improvements and projects at the Little Bighorn. In the last 40 years, most of that money has been used for um, archaeology projects because nothing has changed the interpretation of the battlefield that more than the archaeologists. There have been seven total projects, and that got started in 1983 when there was a huge prairie fire. And it burned the entire battlefield and took out all the grass, the brush, and after that, yes, started reporting bones sticking out of the ground. Well, that got your attention, and so they brought in an archaeologist to check that out, and he said, oh my God, it's true. We need to do a complete survey. And some of you may have seen this on battlefield uh, detectives, but they uh, got three archaeologists, a forensic archaeologist, a battlefield archaeologist, and they asked for volunteers, and over a thousand people volunteered to help do this archaeology project because that would involve digging around the gravestones and everything. It was going to be big. It's neat that a thousand people did that. It makes me feel better because I know I'm not the only certified banana on the planet. There's a lot of history nuts and a lot of little bighorn battle enthusiasts. So anyway, they put together a team of about 90 people. We had a ballistics guy, they had a weapons expert, they had uh, metal detection teams with markers and surveyors, and they went through that battlefield and it was like a crime scene. They had, I mean, this was CSI on steroids, and they ended up <laughs> recovering thousands of artifacts. Bones, bullets, arrowheads. That forensic, or the ballistics guy, he could tell how a different weapon moved across the battlefield, whether it was Indian or soldier, just by finding the, the firing pin marks on these spent casings. Anyway, and, they, and where they found concentrations of bullets, they could tell where they came from. Uh, they just uncovered a ton of stuff and decided we need to do it again, and they did it again five more weeks the following year. And uh, oh boy, they, uh, I mean, they uncovered so much stuff that uh, that's really changed the, the interpretation. The interesting thing is the Indians had been telling us for over 100 years, we got the thing all wrong. And we've ignored them. And the archeology, span every single thing, for example, John Stans in Timber, he was a uh, tribal historian for the Northern Cheyenne, and he told historians a number of things that happened. He said, Custer went to the Little Bighorn twice, to the river twice. We said, oh, well, the archeologists found out that in fact he did. And uh, anyway, everything the Indians told us turned out to be true. So now we're incorporating a lot more uh, Indian testimony and archaeology in our interpretation. And the other thing that did was rendered every library in the world obsolete as far as Custer's interpretation. There's one book that's not obsolete. It's this one. If you need info on it, I can share that with you afterwards. But uh, the other organization, they did a lot of good work. The other organization that landed me here is, uh, is called Just Friends of the Little Bighorn. And it's, uh, our president was the, uh, he used to work as a ranger there, and he understands the, how the system works. There's about 300,000 visitors a year, and, uh, but in January, there's days when they're zero. And in the summer, there's days when there's a thousand. And you get around the time of the battle, and there are many thousands. And so Bob went to the Park Service, because the staff just gets overwhelmed. And they said, uh, he said, we can supply a lot of volunteers from our group to help out during these busy periods. And they jumped all over it, so hence. We get to do that. They get to host dignitaries around and babysit them and, and direct traffic. Because <clears throat> every year they'll get dignitaries up there. Um, they had the governor of Montana, <clears throat> excuse me, two years ago, 
I don't know who that imposter was, but it wasn't John Dutton. Um, anyway, and so while they're babysitting the dignitaries and doing all of that, we get to do the fun stuff and go out on the battlefield and work the different uh, points of interest and talk to all the, all the folks. And you just get some crazy questions. You meet some wonderful people. I won't share all of them with you. The craziest question I ever got was a foreign visitor came up to me a few <laughs> years ago. And out of the blue, he said, I read where Custer had an arrow shoved up his penis. <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, this is a strange topic for extended conversation. But, um, <laughs> and I said, it's true. He did. He did. You read right. And quickly changing the top, the subject, I said, he also had his thigh cut clear to the bone through his thigh muscle. Um, and uh, so in the next life, he was not only not going to procreate, he was not going to ride up, be able to mount a horse and would be very little threat to the Indians. <laughs> but uh, anyway, he also, he wasn't mutilated as badly as most of the rest. He had uh, two bullet wounds. He had both eardrums punched out, and there's a story behind that. But, uh, he had uh, two bullet wounds, one in his chest, one in his head. The one in the chest at first, they didn't notice it because as uh, Private Adams stated, it hadn't bled any. But the one in his head, he got he took a bullet in the left temple, it went out the other side, that bled a lot. And uh, he wasn't scalped, he had thinning hair, and he cut it very short before the campaign, so uh, not much of a trophy, short, and they left it. Anyway, um, <laughs> but, uh, Today, I'm going to give you a little background quickly, and we're going to do Reader's Digest because of the time constraint on the battle, and then we'll get into a little of the aftermath, and I definitely will stay as long as anybody wants, even out there, to help answer any questions uh, anybody might have. So, let's see if we can... Well, I did it right. Anyway, the battles in the summer of 1876, the Indians all knew the soldiers were coming for them. They'd been given an ultimatum saying by January 31, you better get to the reservation or we're sending people out to drive you to the reservation. Well, some of these tribes, like Tasunka Witko and Tatanka Ayotanka, we know them as Sitting Bull, or Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull, they'd never been to a reservation. They'd never signed the treaty. They had no intention of coming in. They were going to fight. And all the other tribes of the Sioux, there's seven tribes of the Teton Sioux, all gathered together. And the Cheyenne, their allies, gathered together. And this village, I mean, there is safety in numbers. This village was getting huge. They even had some woodland Sioux under old Ing Paduta who joined them. This village is big, and it's getting bigger by the day because every day, Hundreds of warrior, uh, warriors and their families are coming from the reservations to join this band. And at one point, they're on the Rosebud River, which is in southeast Montana. And at one point, the, the trail they left was a mile wide. And they moved up the, up the Rosebud to a place called Deer Medicine Rocks. And they held their Sundance, Sitting Bull, had 50 pieces of flesh cut out of each arm, and he danced, and he prayed to walk on Tonga, the great mystery of everywhere spirit. And he bled, and he danced, and he danced, and he bled, and he passed out. And when he came to, he had a vision of many soldiers falling down into camp, and they're coming down upside down like grasshoppers, and they're all dead. And this was great news because he was the spiritual leader of this group, and they realized if he said that any time the soldiers attacked them, they, the Indians were going to win. Well, they moved on up to Rosebud, they went over the divide to the Little Bighorn, and uh, Custer is hot on their trail. And by the 24th, he's within a day's march of the Indian camp, which is now on the Little Bighorn. His scouts have been telling him all along, <laughs> you're going to run into more Indians than you can handle. They knew how big this village was. 
And he said, you do the scouting, I'll do the fighting. <laughs> and I fought a village like this once before, and I did quite well, thank you very much. Well, what he was talking about is he attacked a camp of uh, Southern Cheyenne under Black Kettle on the Washita River. <laughs> this camp had 52 lodges, 250 people, of which about 60 were warriors. He had over 500 men. He attacked the camp, quickly captured it. He captured the pony herd. He captured 53 women and children. Uh, I don't know that he was planning that. I think that was more accident. But what he didn't know is downstream, there were many very large villages. And when they figured out what was happening, the warriors came up to attack Custer. And there were over a thousand of them. And the minute they opened fire, these women howled, howled to high heaven, and the warriors stopped, pulled back, and Custer won. And this established his reservation, uh, pardon me, his reputation as, a, uh, as an Indian fighter. And like I said, I think that was accidental. They don't teach hostage taking at West Point for sure. But he knew this is different fighting. That fighting Indians is different. And that's the secret to winning. And he planned to do the same thing to the village on the Little Bighorn, this one. Uh, the trouble is this village had about 1,200 lodges between six and 8,000 people, of which up to 2,000 were warriors. This is a very different animal, but he's unfazed. Very aggressive guy, very aggressive, brave and aggressive. So he goes skating up there. His scouts tell him the, that the village has moved to the Little Bighorn. So he does a night march and gets to up near the divide. And then after dawn on the 25th of June, the scouts say, we spotted the Indian village. And he decides, I'm going to lay low and I'll attack them at dawn the next day. Well, several scouting parties, hunting parties of Sioux discovered that the, they saw, spotted his command. And when he was told of this, he decided, I need to attack now. He was afraid they would warn the village and the village would get away. This village wasn't running from anybody. Uh, but anyway, over the divide he goes and he stopped and broke his command, split it up into four separate divisions. One was he gave a company to the pack train and took seven men from all the other companies to guard the pack train, which had consisted of 150 mules, stubborn, slow moving, but they carried all the supplies and ammunition. And he assigned those men to that. He gave three companies to a guy named Frederick Manteen, a Virginian, who hated Custer's guts, he couldn't stand it. And he sent him off to the left on a tangent to look for more Indian villages in some of these small tributaries and upstream on the Little Bighorn. This would turn into a wild goose chase and ultimately prove fatal to Custer. And Ben Keen said, General, since we're fighting so many Indians, should we keep the regiment all together? He said, you have your orders. And off Ben Keen go. He had Major Reno, who hadn't fought Indians much. He gave him three companies. He's got a total of 12. He gave him three companies and sent him across the river to attack the village. And he told him, you'll be supported by the whole outfit. Well, <laughs> off Reno goes and he crosses the river. Custer, meanwhile, he, uh, let me see if this thing works. He's, Reno is coming on, this is the Little Bighorn River. And right here you see the different Indian camps. The Old Papas are on this end, the Cheyennes are on the other. Uh, this thing goes for over a mile. It's a huge camp. Custer has Reno skating down here to attack the southern end of the camp. He's going up here behind the bluffs. Behind this first line, these are the bluffs. They're about 100 feet high. There. And uh, he's going to attack the other end of the village and hopefully capture a lot of women and children. Well, Reno comes down here. Custer gets to this spot right around here, and this is 
this thing here is uh, Sharpshooter Ridge. It's an elevator, right? He sees the village for the first time. He can't even see all of it from there. This part is hidden. But he realizes it's a huge camp. He says, hurrah, boys, we've caught them napping. We'll finish them up and go home to our station. And all he sees is women, children, some dogs and horses skating around in there. And he doesn't see many warriors. He thinks maybe they're out hunting. Well, he moves down this side of the river. And now he gets to Weir Point. This is the highest point elevation on the battlefield. He sees the rest of the village. He starts down in here and decides, maybe I need more men. And he decides to recall Benti. Well, he sends a, a messenger, his most famous message in the history of Indian warfare anyway. It's in the museum at West Point. And the message reads, Benti, come on, big village, be quick, bring packs. And P.S., bring packs, meaning ammunition packs. So he sends this guy, John Martin, he goes skating back this way to try and find Ben Teen, and Custer moves down to the river right here. When he's on Weir Point, he sees Reno has begun his attack. And this is as far as he got. He got within about a quarter of a mile of the village, and warriors start coming out by the hundreds, and he stopped dead in his tracks. But he's there long enough to fire several volleys into the village. Well, when the bullets go streaking through the, the teepees on that end of the village, all the non-combatants, the women, children, they take off the other way. They're heading north. Custer then moves on down to this point. He arrives about 10 minutes after Reno attack. And as soon as he gets there, he realizes this is Medicine Tail Cooley, by the way. And this is North Medicine Tail, or Deep Cooley. And uh, he realizes, A, I'm not at the end of the village yet. This is really a big camp. And B, the worst news, he sees the women and children already in this area here. They're escaping to the north. He has to get them. So he pulls back. He's only here about probably 15 20 minutes at the most. That's long enough to get one, maybe two officers and several men killed. But uh, he pulls back and he goes to Calhoun Hill. This right here is, uh, it's not marked, but this is the most important feature here. That's Battle Ridge. It's almost a mile long. It's a hogback ridge. And on this end right there, that's Calhoun Hill. There's a little rise. On the other end, is Last Stand Hill. They weren't named that that day of the battle yet, but uh, I often wonder what, if he knew the future names of these places, he might have changed how he was handling things. But anyway, he pulls back. He said he's pulling back to that area, which is Calhoun Hill. But he takes two companies straight to there, and he takes three companies to here. He wants to see if he can see any sign that Ben Dean's coming. And because uh, he can see there's a lot of hostages that are escaping. And about the time he gets there, <clears throat> here comes, he spots a bunch of soldiers suddenly topping the ridge there. And he thinks, that's got to be Ben Dean. He's in the area, he's close, it won't be too long, and he'll be joining me. So Custer moves right to Calhoun Hill. He leaves three companies there to wait for Ben T. Because when all those folks join him, he's gonna have over 300 men. But he has to stop the hostages from getting away and he takes, goes behind the ridge, down this ravine, straight to the river, and there they are. The problem is there's 3,000 of them. Custer has 80 men. It's really hard to surround 20 Indians with one soldier. I mean, he knows now he has to have Benteen. If Benteen and the reinforcements arrive with 300 guys, he can capture enough people, he can still win this thing. It's a gamble, but he's a gambler. He's just aggressive and a gambler. And he's waiting and he's waiting, but guess what? Benteen's not coming. And I'll get to that in a few minutes. While he's down there, uh, he's waiting in this area 
He stopped the non-combatants from going any farther north, but they're all accumulating around, uh, this is Squaw Ravine, it's also known as Chasing Creek. Um, and he's waiting and he's thinking, what in the world is the holdup? He waits about 20 minutes. He's getting really impatient. He's also starting to take fire from warriors showing up. And we know at least one guy got killed there through the archaeologists found him. Um, and he pulls back up to withdraw us to this area, which is Cemetery Ridge. It's a high point before you get to um, um, Last Stand Hill. And this is probably when he may have soiled his pants. Because what he sees coming from the Calhoun Hill area is about 1,500 Indians, warriors, chasing, they have overrun Calhoun Hill, and they're chasing the survivors who are running for their lives towards him. Well, he moves up to Last Stand Hill, the high spot there, and of the 135 men that were there on Calhoun Hill, only about 20 make it to Custer. And he's in big trouble. And he's taking, the warriors now swarm all around him, and he's taken a lot of fire from this position. If you've ever visited the battlefield, if you stand on that spot and look at the north face of Last Stand Hill, good Lord, anybody sitting there is a sitting duck. And so he said, uh, bugle sounds, and E Company goes off of the ridge, and they take this area right there. At the same time, a lone rider on a very fast horse takes off to the south. I'll get to him later. And uh, anyway, but at this point, he's still taking gunfire from every other point on the compass, and nothing can save him from the thousands of arrows that are arcing in. At this point, they shoot their horses. If you're a soldier and you are 500 miles from your home post and civilization and you just shot your horse, you have to know you're probably not going home. And none of them did. They're all still there with their horses. So as even using the horses as a barricade, the gunfire and the arrows are still coming in from every other direction. And they fought pretty fiercely, but it only lasted about 20 minutes. And the, according to the Indians, the soldiers' shots quit coming. And they rushed the position. And to their surprise, about 10 or 15 guys who were still alive jumped up and made a, a run to Deep Ravine uh, to try and get to the river, and none of them made it. But the guys who were on, on Cemetery Hill about 40 of them, they took off heading for Deep Ravine. They got as far as Deep Ravine, about half of them were killed outside the ravine, the other half jumped into the ravine, and they were killed. And Custer's fight's over. It took about two hours, and 210 men are dead. Meanwhile, Reno <laughs> and Ben Keen uh, we left him right here while well, he withdrew into the timber when the Indians, it, by hundreds, are coming out to foot face him. And he's not there very long, and pretty soon six or seven hundred Indians. He pulls into the timber for protection. They're infiltrating the timber and shooting his men, and they're starting to shoot at the horse holders. Renos decides, I get out of here now, or I get out of here never. And he shouts to his men, Mount your horses and follow me if you wish to save yourselves. And away he goes. And this would be the bloodiest five minute ride in the history of the 7th Cavalry. Because he goes skating back this way. He, and to the Indians, this is like a buffalo chase. They're racing their ponies up next to them, these soldiers, and shooting them at point blank. They're shooting their horses and trampling the riders. Reno finally crosses the river right about here and gets up to this point on top of the bluffs. He and about 90 survivors arrive up there. And uh, along comes Ben Team. Reno had only been fighting in the valley 30 minutes, but he lost two officers and about 30 men killed. So he didn't have a real good time down there. Uh, Reno, they're in this area right here. 
And here comes Ben T. He got Custer's message. And he says to Reno, where's Custer? Reno, first of all, rushed up to him and said, for God's sakes, stop, halt your command and help me. I've lost half my men. Ben Teen says, where's Custer? Reno says, I don't have a clue where Custer is. And Re Ben Teen stops. He's not coming to Custer, who, as we know, was counting on him. Not anymore, he's dead. But, uh, so they <laughs> stay here, waiting for the pack train. And um, while they're here, there's some warriors that are on this high point we call it Sharpshooter Ridge. Not that they were all sharpshooters, but they're firing into these soldiers and doing some damage. And so a company of these soldiers is sent to drive them off, and which wasn't hard to do. They were already leaving to go fight Custer anyway. But when the soldiers top that ridge, Custer, who's over here on the high ground, and he also has some scouts on even higher ground than that, sees them when those soldiers topped that ridge, and he, that's what he thought was Ben Keen. Well, when he turned north, these guys turned back south. The Indians are off the ridge, it's safe. And they mill around here, and for an hour and a half, they can hear Custer's gunfire, but they don't move. And Captain Weir says, we've got to go to Custer. Ben Keen, remember he's the guy who hates his guts. And Reno, who's completely demoralized by now, and somewhat inebriated. He's in no hurry. And they wait, and they wait, and finally Captain Weir gets impatient, and he says, I'm gonna go see what's going on with Custer. And he moves to this spot right here, which is the highest elevation on the battlefield. And when they get up there, the shots have quit coming by now, or they can't hear them. And he realizes, they can't make any sense out of what they see because three miles away is Last Stand Hill. They see Indians milling around. They're riding around on horseback shooting at objects on the ground and they don't know what's going on. They think Custer must have been repulsed and withdrawn to the north. Uh, they don't know. He is dead. So <laughs> when the Indians, now they're all finished with Custer. They're all done with him. They spot these guys and they come racing after them. And these guys pull back to their original position right here. And Reno, Benteen, they dig in and they survive about a 24 hour siege. The Indians fight them all the rest of the 25th, all of the 26th, and finally toward evening on the 26th, the Indian encampment packs up and they move off this way to the south because there's more soldiers coming from the north, General Terry with his command. Uh, the 27th, Terry arrives. And when he gets up on the hilltop, they give him three cheers. He's saved, we're all gonna be saved. Terry's got tears coming down his cheeks. And they ask, what's the matter? And where's Custer? And he tells them Custer and all his men are on a hillside four miles away and they're all dead. And these guys could hardly believe it. They just couldn't believe Custer would be completely wiped out. Well, the next day they believed it. They're sent to bury the dead. And they get there and the scene that, <laughs> that they run into is just beyond description. Lieutenant Godfrey said it was a scene of sickening and ghastly horror. The bodies had all been stripped of their clothing and horribly mutilated. They've been out there, this is the 28th. They were killed on the 25th. The temperature every day was around 97 or 98 degrees. These guys are in really bad shape. They are bloated, they're covered with flies, they're turning black, they smell the high heaven plus the mutilations. Almost a third of the command of Custer's men had been beheaded. Others had arms and legs cut off and they're strewn all around. It really was a nasty scene. And uh, to make matters worse, they, didn't, they don't have a lot of shovels with them. And you can't even pick the bodies up. The skin slips off, it's just a mess. And these poor guys have to be relieved every five minutes because they're getting sick, the burial detail. 
and they bury, they just take the scooping dirt onto the top of these, these dead soldiers, the bodies. These burials are simply token burials. And two individuals had done a really good job of scooping a lot of uh, dirt onto Thomas Wood, or pardon me, uh, Vickery, but they, when they first arrived, they can't understand it. I mean, they, they can't identify any of these guys. Because the other thing that happened is about half of the men who were not beheaded had their heads smashed to pudding. And uh, Sergeant Knight, Daniel Knight, he's puzzled. He can't find his commanding officer, Tom Custer. He walks past a body on the apex of Last Stand Hill. This body's lying face down, all the hair scalped off, the eyes, the tongue, the genitals, everything's gone. Abdomen split wide open, his intestines are on the ground. His head had been hammered with a stone mallet till it was the thickness of the palm of your hand. This is just to give you an idea. I'll stop there. But uh, that they didn't, there's no way to identify this guy until they roll him over. There's a tattoo on his forearm. Goddess of Liberty with an American flag, and below that, TWC, Thomas Ward Custer. Without that, they never identify him. Lieutenant Crittenden had the shot arrows into both his eye sockets. He had a glass eye. It shattered one of his glass eye before they hammered his head. And that's how they just how they identified him. You know, Calhoun, once considered the handsomest man in the Seventh Cavalry, was only identified by some dental work and unique fillings he had. So anyway, that's enough of that. Uh, th this was really a horrible, horrible scene. So they're scooping dirt on these guys. There were three officers they never identified. Sturgis, Harrington, Porter. They know Sturgis and Porter were dead. Their bullet riddle bloody clothes were found in the abandoned Indian camp. Harrington at the time, nothing. They did find something later, but that's another story. Um, so they took to scooping dirt on all these bodies. When they scooped a lot of dirt on one of these bodies, they left about a, a foot deep trench. And one of the officers said, that'd be a great place to bury the general. So they rolled Custer up in a blanket, carry him down, plop him in there, scoop dirt on him, plopped his brother Tom next to him, scoop dirt on him, they drove stakes into the ground at the head of each officer and marked them so they could tell where the officers, the 10 officers they identified were buried, and they left. They had 52 wounded men. They had to get to the steamboat to get to proper medical care. They could do no more. Well, you can guess, within a matter of days, the bodies were uncovered. And here came the magpies, anything that he feeds on roadkill, uh, crows, the birds, not the Indians, and uh, wolves, coyotes, everything. And they go to work, and it is just awful. This is still a scene of sickening, ghastly horror. Well, a year later, a party comes to recover the officer's remains. All the wooden stakes, let's see if I get the right one. All the uh, stakes, you can see some of these stakes, whoops, I've got a pointer, uh, where they mark the officers. The stakes are all there, but it's just the bones are scattered. They pick up some bones and put them in Custer's uh, pine box, and someone notices those are attached, they're wearing a corporal's blouse. Well, Custer wasn't a corporal, so they pulled those bones out, put another set in, and all they had was a skull, part of the backbone, a thigh bone, and some small bones. And they're describing the, the skull. They didn't describe a bullet hole in it, so we don't know. Uh, that Most likely that may not have been Custer, but the commanding officer came by and said, nail the box up. It will be all right as long as people think so. They put Tom Custer's bones in his box, and again, they put the skull in, they thought, well, this is about the shape and size of his head. Well, his head had been pounded to fragments, so that's not the right one. Anyway, they put bones in the boxes, nailed them all up, and back 
they went. And Custer's, uh, the bones that were in Custer's box are currently buried at West Point. Uh, I'm sure most, if not all of him is probably still at the Little Bighorn. But, they, they, you know, and then they mounted dirt over the other bodies, all the other soldiers, drove the cedar stake in the, in the ground to mark where they were all at, and they left. Well, a, a year later, another company uh, comes along, actually right after them, within three weeks, another company came along. Half the bones are exposed from this wind and rain. They pile more dirt on them and they take off. A year later, Jerusha Sturgis, the mother of James Sturgis, the uh, lieutenant who was her only son, she visited the battlefield to see where her son died. Well, when they heard out she, she was coming, they, piled, they made a nice neat little grave, fake grave with a fake uh, headboard, and but what they didn't know, she already knew her son's remains were never identified. But when she got there, this field was still a boneyard. She wasn't too impressed with the uh, fake grave, and she was upset enough, she wrote to her uncle, who was none other than William Tecumseh Sherman, the general of the army, and he, he ordered General Terry, he said, get some people down there and fix this. So the following year, he went, with a company of soldiers. This time they brought a lot of shovels and they dug holes by each of the marks, put all the remains they could find in there, covered it up. Uh, this, is, uh, this is after the first burial parties have been. That, uh, <laughs> the teepee pole with uh, the boot bottom on it, that's where Custer was buried. It's still just a mess. And uh, so when they came out, they buried all the, all the men. They dug holes and finally got the remains underground and stood them on top. And then uh, they left. Well, when he left, he said, this was Captain Sanderson was in charge of this burial detail. And he said, the battlefield now has a neat and tidy appearance. Um, I'm a little fuzzy on neat and tidy. But this ain't it. <laughs> this photographer is still hanging around, the one that took the previous picture. Now this is all horse bone. There are no human there. There were 90 horses killed in this battle, only two of which were Indian ponies. But uh, that's a lot of horse bone. And uh, there's those wooden teepee poles. But uh, so it wasn't until two years later that the monument was sent out. And they erected that on Last Stand Hill. And uh, when they did that, they dug a trench, a wide trench, all the way around that monument. That's the one that was behind me in that first picture. It has the names of all the soldiers killed in the battle. And they went to all the graves, got all the human bones, all the remains they could find, put them in the trench. They had bones from the valley, from the reno Benteen area, they put those in the trench. They dug another trench behind that and stuck all the horse bones in there. So finally, They've got the monument on Last Stand Hill, and the battlefield actually might be neat and tidy. Uh, they didn't do anything else. It was nine years after that that the marble markers, the stone markers, were sent out. And they sent one for every soldier killed, you know, including the Valley and Reno Benteen guys. Well, Captain Sweet, this guy didn't know how many men actually died with Custer. He knew four people died in the Valley with Reno. Two officers, McIntosh and Hodgson, and then uh, Scout Charlie Reynolds and Isaiah Dorman, who was an interpreter and the only white man with the regiment at that time. And, and so he put markers for them. Up on Reno Benteen, he had no idea. He sprinkled five or six markers up there, and the rest of the markers he placed on Last Stand Hill. Well, there were some of the places where he found a stake marking where a soldier had been buried, and there's two shallow depressions on each side of it where the people had scooped dirt from each side of the body onto it. Well, he thought that's two bodies exhumed. He put two markers there. He went off, there's 43 paired markers, 86 markers, 43 are spurious. You remember the fake grave for Sturgis? Well, he had a 
tombstone there for Sturgis, he plopped it there. It's it's spurious, meaning nothing's there, nothing ever was there. So when he's all done, you end up with 252 markers on a battlefield where 210, 210 died. Only 206 were actually found and buried on that field. In the valley, where at least maybe three dozen men were killed, there's the four markers I told you about. On the Reno Benteen site, he's got the five or six I told you about sprinkled up there. There were at least 15 men buried there. On Weir Point, there was only one guy uh, killed there, Vincent Charlie, and uh, there's a marker for it. It's nowhere near the right spot, but it's a marker and it's there. On Calhoun Hill, where 37 men were in a, fighting in a skirmish line and they pretty much all of them died there. There's no markers denoting that skirmish line. On Last Stand Hill, where 40 bodies were buried, there's 52 markers. This really gets good. Because between here and down here is, is Deep Ravine, there are only 10 or 12 men buried there. There are 53 markers. In Deep Ravine, where 28 men at least were found dead, the minimum, there's zero markers. We know that Sergeant John Ogden made it all the way to the river. They carved his name in a cottonwood tree. There's no marker. And now there's no tree. Who knew cottonwoods wouldn't last forever? <laughs> And on the other side of the river, uh, Private William Brown, he made it to the West Bank before he was cut down and killed. No marker. So anyway, today, <laughs> you've got too many markers. Many of them are misplaced. But if you allow for the fact that the, uh, that the uh, parent markers only represent one individual, the majority of the markers do represent where a soldier fell and there's no other battlefield in the world that looks like that. So I'm, uh, I'm going to cut it off there. I could talk about other stuff, but um, I was in to talk and say I'll see you on, if, if you visit the battlefield around the anniversary, I'll see you on Last Stand Hill. Not this year. They're replacing the visitor center, that building, not the TV, the building, and they're going to build a new visitor center there. And that won't be completed until 2026. And so uh, Mary and I just got an email. Mary helped volunteer there last year and said, we won't need you this year. We're going to shut down the battlefield. It's only going to be open on probably Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So if anybody does plan a visit, check the website uh, for the National Park Service see if it's even open. And it's just going to be a massive construction site. But it's going to have a grand opening for the new visitor center on 20, in 2026. That will be the 150 year anniversary of the battle. And if you're there, I'll see you on last day at Hill. <laughs> so anyway, that's, it's going to be a big deal. And I will wind it up there. And, Can we ask you this? Okay, so um, George, that was an excellent presentation. So we've got some questions, and I'll bring it, Jim, to you. I was kidding. That was great, George. Um, can you can you talk a little bit about the uh, Treaty of Fort Laramie and and the following uh, gold rush and the Black Hills and how that relates to this? Okay, I really don't need to talk about those because that's the reason for this war. Jim just explained it. <laughs> Uh, the Treaty of Fort Laramie in 1868, which was signed by Red Cloud and many of the Sioux, it guaranteed the Black Hills to the Sioux. And they had unceded territory all the way from South Dakota to the Bighorn Mountains was all unceded. They could hunt there as long as the grass grew and the rivers water flowed and whatever. And then gold was discovered in the Black Hills. We never had much trouble making treaties. We sure as had, had no trouble breaking treaties. And this, a lot of the land that they're on was guaranteed to the Indians by that treaty of 1868. Now the land where the battle actually took place, that was 
given to the crows who had been kicked off of that land probably 20, 30 years before that. But that was the cause of the war. Grant wanted the Black Hills. Gold had been discovered there. There's already 10,000 miners flowing in there. Indians don't know what to do. And the government's in a dilemma. And they say, okay, you have to sell the hills. And when the Indians wouldn't sell the hills, that's when they said, okay, you all would change your mind. You have to live on the reservation. And you have to report there by January 36. Have you ever been up in South Dakota or North Dakota in January? Sweet Jesus, you can't go anywhere on a highway half the time. And they're supposed to go to the reservation. They had no intention anyway. But that, thanks for, that's a great question because that's what started the, the Great Sioux War of 76, 77.